Chapter 18 of Humorous Ghosts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Smith. Humorous Ghost Stories. Selected by Dorothy Scarborough. The Ghost That Got the Button. By Will Adams. One autumn evening, when the days were shortening and the darkness fell early on Hotchkiss, and the frost was beginning to adorn with its fine, glistening lace, the carbine barrels of the night centuries as they walked post. Sergeants Hanson and Whitney and Corporal Wrighthall had come to Stone's room after supper, filling the need common to all men in the first cold nights of the year for a cozy room, a good smoke, and congenial companionship. The steam heat, newly turned on, wheezed and whined through the radiator. The air was blue and dense with tobacco smoke. The three sergeants reposed in restful, if inelegant, attitudes, and Whitehall, his feet on the window sill, and his wooden chair tilted back, was holding forth between puffs at a very battered pipe about an old colored woman who kept a little saloon in town. So she got mad at those K Troop men he said, and next day when Turner stopped there for a drink, she says, you get out of here. You men from the arsenic with the crossbones on your caps, I ain't letting you in. But the medical corpses and the non-efficient officers, they may come in. The laugh that followed was interrupted by the approach of a raucous shrieking noise that rose and fell in lugubrious cadence. What the deuce, exclaimed Whitehall, starting up. That's Bill, exclaimed Stone. Bill Sullivan. He thinks he's singing. Funny you never heard him before, kid. But then he's not often taken that way. Thank the Lord. Come in, Bill, he called. And tell us what's the matter. You feel sick? Where's the pain? He asked as Big Bill appeared in the doorway. Come in, hombre, and rest yourself, invited Whitney and hospitably handed over his tobacco pouch. What was that tune y'all were singing out yonder? Thanks, responded Bill, settling down. That there tune was, I wonder where you are tonight, my love. Sounded like sister's teeth are plugged with zinc, commented Whitney. Or looking through the knot hole in Papa's wooden leg, said Whitehall. Or he won't buy the Ashman a manicure set, added Stone. No reiterated bill solemnly it was like i told you i wonder where you are tonight my love and it's a corker too i seen a feller in a gold singing it in kelly's vaudeville palace out to a cheyenne unked first he'd sing one voice and then he'd, she'd sing the next he was dressed like a soldier and while he sang they was showing tabloids of what the girl was doing behind him and then when she sang her voice, he'd be in the tabloid, and when I got to the last voice, and he was dying on a stretcher in an ambulance, everybody in the house was a-crying, so you could hardly hear her. It was great. My, continued Bill, spreading out his great paws over the radiator. Ain't this the snappy evening? Real cold. Somehow it minds me of the cold we had in China, that time of the boxes after we'd got to the legations. The nights was cold, just like this. Why, Bill, said Whitney, I never knew y'all were there then. Why did you never tell us before? What were you with? Fourteenth Infantry, responded Bill, proudly. It's a great old regiment. Don't care if they are doughboys. What company was you in? inquired Hanson, ponderously, taking his pipe from his mouth and breaking silence. For the first time j company same as this at this reply stone opened his mouth abruptly to say something but thought better of it and shut up again it was blame cold them nights a week or so after we was camped in the temple of agriculture that's what they called it i don't know why but say the heat coming up from tinston was frying it was just boiling bacon and bubbling worse a heap than anything we'd had in the islands we chuckled away most every last thing on that hike but canteens and rifles. I was a darn fool thing to do, 
the chuckin was a uh, course but it come out all right cause extra supplies followed us up on the pie hole in junks ain't that a funny name for a river pie hole every time i got homesick i'd say that river and then i'd see hogan's diary lunch for ladies and gents on the old bulvery and hear the kid mick hogan yelling jaw one in the dark white wings let her flop pie hole ain't it helped me a heap bill settled himself and stretched but what i really wanted to tell you's about said he was something that happened one o oh, these dear cold nights it gets almighty cold there in september and it was sure the spookiest show i ever seen even mom haggerty's table wrappings in hester street never come up to it there was three of us fellers who ran in a bunch them days me and buck dugan my bunkie from the bowery like me he was a corporal and ranch fields we called him that cause he always walked on a ranch before he come into the fourteenth they was great fellers buck and ranch was buck now you couldn't phase him you couldn't never phase him no matter what sort of job you put him up against he'd slide through slick as a geek greased rat the cap'n he knew it too unct when we was fightin and hadn't no men to spare he left buck on guard over about twenty-five box of prisoners in a courtyard and tells him he doesn't let one escape but buck wants to get into the fight with the rest of the boys and when he finds that if he leaves them chinoo's loose in the yard alone till they'll get out plenty quick what does he do but time tight up by their pigtails to some posts he knows they can't undo them tight tight knots backwards ain't no chink would cut his pigtail if he did have a knife he'd die first and so buck skidoos off to the fight and sure enough when the cap'n wants them boxers they're ready tied up and waitin that was his sort of gee but he was smart we was all right interested in them allies of course and watched em close but bill says buck to me one night it's been working in me nut that there, these here fellers ain't so different from what we know already exceptin for their uniform and outfits we've met em all before but the japs why look a here says he first there's the white men the english ain't they just like us except that they're thicker and we're longer and their injun niggers ain't we seen their clothes in the comic operas and them without their clothes in the monkey cage at central park and their hong kong china regiment and all the other chinos is just the same as you meet in the pipe joints in mott street then says he come all the dagos these leather necks of macaroni dagos we've seen all swarming all over mulberry bend and five points the sauerkraut dagos looks for all the wood like they was going to a schitzen fest up by high bridge the froggy dagos you'll find packed in them frenchy restaurants in the thirties where you get blue wine and them vodka dagos only needs a push cart to make you think you're in baxter street buck he could sure talk but ranch he wasn't much on chin chin little and dark and quiet he was uh, and just crazy for dogs any old mud would do for him just so's it was in the shape of a pup he was fair wild for him. he picked up a yellow cur out there the day after the yankston fight and that there no account mangy flea bitten mutt had to stay with us the whole time if the pup didn't stand in me and buck and ranch he swore he'd quit too so we had to let him come and he messed and bucked with our outfit right along ranch named him daggett after the colonial which was right hard on the ceo but i bet ranch thought he was complimenting him why ranch considered himself honored if any of the pup's fleas hopped off on him the pup he kept along with us right through everything ranch watched him like the apple of his eye and uh, he hardly ever was out of all sight till one night about a week after we quartered in the temple he didn't turn up for supper 
He was always so regular at his chow that ranch began to get the squirms, and when come taps and Daggett hadn't reported, ranch had the razzle dazzles. Next morning, the f first thing he must go hunt that pup, and went a scouting all day. Me and Buck helping him, but nary pup, and come another supper without that miserable mutt, and ranch was up and alley all. Right, all right. He was all wore out, and I made him hit the bunk early and try to sleep, but Lord, no sooner he drop off and he get to twitching and hitching and wake up a yelping for Daggett. Long about taps. Buck, who's been out on a private reconnaissance, comes back and whispers to me, Sst, Bill, the cur's found. Don't tell Ranch. The bloke died of heart failure. I struck his trail and followed it. And say, Bill, what in your thunder do you think? Them heathen chinos has at him. Lord, now wouldn't that jolt use? Them chinos a eating Daggett? It give me an awful jar. And Buck, he felt it too, that their mutt had acted right decent, and we knew Ranch would have bats in the belfry for a fair if he hold till all the pups finish. So says Buck, let's not tell him, cause he's taken on now like he'd lost mother and father and best go and on if he knew daggett was providing chow for chinos he'd go clean bug house and we'd have to ship him home to saint elizabeth i says okay to that and we made it up not to let on to ranch and now here comes the spook part you're been a waiting for four or five nights later i was on guard my post was the farthest out we'd had on the north. There was an old road out over that way, and I'd hauled till it led to a graveyard. But I hadn't ever been there myself, and hadn't that thought much about it till long between two and three o'clock, as I was a hiking up and o and down when something comes a, s a sizzin down the road, hell for leather on to me, a yelling something fierce. Gee, but I was scared. I made sure it was a spook, and there wasn't a bit of breath left in me. I was all to the bad that time for sure. Before I had time to think even, that screaming, streaking thing was on me and a grabbing round my knees, and then I see it was one of old in there Christian chinos, and he scared more than me even. His eyes had popped clean out in their slits, and his tongue was hanging out by the roots. He was that locoed. I raised a long yell for corporal of the guard, which happened by good luck to be Buck, and when he come a-running, thinking from the whoops I give, he was being rushed by the whole push of boxers. The two of us began prodding at the chink to find out what was doing. Took us some time, too, with him being in such a flutter and hardly able to even hand out his darn old pigeon English. That sounds like language coming out of a sausage machine. When we did savey his line of old chop suey talk, we found out he'd seen a ghost in the graveyard. And not only seen it, but he knew who the spook was and all about him. He was getting some serious ourselves and made him tell us. Seems it was a mandarin. That's a sort old chink police court judge. Till I got to her tensed and I always thought they was little oranges. And this tangerine's, I mean mandarin's, name was Wu T. Ming Ang. He'd been a high mucky muckracker in his day, which was two or three hundred years back. But the emperor caught him deep in some sort of old graft and took away his button and all of his dough. Lord says, Buck, when we come her to this, don't that prove what heathen's chinks is? Only one button to keep on their clothes with, and the emperor, he can take it away. What did this here Judge Ming do then, John? You string or pins? This here John didn't seem ter savvy, but he said that the Mandarin took on so fur his button and his loss of pull in the ward that it was sure sad ter see. And by and by the Emperor got busy again with him and had him finished up for keeps. Had him die the death of a thousand cuts, says John. It sounded fierce to me, but Buck, he says, Psh, anybody's been shaved regular by them Lady Barbers on Fourth Avenue, 
would have give the emperor that merry ha-ha. After Ming was cut up, they took the remains of his corpse and planted him in this here graveyard up the road. But he wouldn't stay planted and began doing stunts at night, topside, walkie-walkie, and a hunting for his lost button. He'd used to have the whole country scared up, but for the last twenty years he'd kept right quiet and hardly ever come out. But now, since the foreign devil's come, ain't that a sweet name for us, he's up and at it again, worse than ever, and the heathens is on their ear. For four nights now they'd seen him, wrapped in a blue robe, waiting and hunting behind tombstones and a-walking. Round and round the graveyard lies six days, race for the belt at Madison Square. John had just seen him on the wall, and that was why he come charging down the road like forty cats. Well, Mr. Ming spurt walk till he gets that button back, Buck asks. John says, sure. Well, says Buck, why don't you give him one? No can give, only emperor, only son of heaven give. Well, look here, says Buck. We sand rabbits ain't no sons of heaven. But I'll be darned if we couldn't spare a button to lay the ghost of a poor busted police court judge who's lost his job and his tin. If that's all he wants back, what time does he come out at, John? Could we see him to Merle Knight? Sure could we, says John. He'll show us the way, but he won't be wait with us. He's bad enough for his. So Buck takes John and goes back to the guard shack as it's most time for relief. And after I got back, we told John to get the hook and we talked things over. And Buck, he was just wild to see if he couldn't lay that china ghost. His talents was aching get action on him anything like that got up his buck says i maybe ranch can't help well tell him to morrow after guard mount i'll take his mind off of daggett no you don't says buck don't your dale tell him he's nervous as a cat over the pup as it is and this spook business is awful scary i'm feeling woozy over it myself the remains of his corpse and planted him in this here graveyard up the road. But he wouldn't stay planted and began doing stunts at night, topside, walkie-walkie, and a hunting for his lost button. He'd used to have the whole country scared up, but for the last twenty years he'd kept right quiet and hardly ever come out. But now, since the foreign devil's come, ain't that a sweet name for us, he's up and at it again worse than ever and the heathens is on their ear for four nights now they'd seen him wrapped in a blue robe waiting and hunting behind tombstones and a-walking round and round the graveyard lies six days race for the belt at madison square john had just seen him on the wall and that was why he come charging down the road like forty cats well, Mr. Ming spurt walk till he gets that button back, Buck asks. John says, sure. Well, says Buck, why don't you give him one? No can give, only emperor, only son of heaven give. Well, look here, says Buck, we sand rabbits ain't no sons of heaven. But I'll be darned if we couldn't spare a button to lay the ghost of a poor busted police court judge who's lost his job and his tin. If that's all he wants back, what time does he come out at, John? Could we see him to Merle Knight? Sure could we, says John. He'll show us the way, but he won't be wait with us. He's bad enough for his. So Buck takes John and goes back to the guard shack as it's most time for relief, and after I got back, we told John to get the hook, and we talked things over. And Buck, he was just wild to see if he couldn't lay that china ghost. His talents was aching to get action on him, anything like that got up his buck, says I. Maybe Ranch can help. Well, tell him to morrow after guard mount, I'll take his mind off of Daggett. 
"'No, you don't,' says Buck. "'Don't your dale tell him. "'He's nervous as a cat over the pup, "'as it is, and this spook business is awful scary. "'I'm feeling woozy over it myself. "'I'm all off when it comes to a ghost. "'That is, if it's a real ghost. "'And things here in Perkin is so funny, "'the odds is all in favor of its being the sure thing. "'I ain't afraid of oh no kinds of old people, "'but I sure get cold feet when I'm up against a ghost.' Wouldn't that jaw use, and me a soldier? When it's a soldier's whole business not to get cold feet, but I'm bound I'll have a show at that old spook, even if it does scare me out of oh my growth. Only don't you dare tell Ranch. Next night, right after eleven o'clock rounds, me and Buck slipped out of our blankets, sneaked out past the guard, and met John. He was waiting for us in the road just beyond where the last century would have seen him. He was cold as get out, just the same kind of old early cold as tonight, and John's teeth was a chattering like peas in a box. He was some loco with skier too, you bet. Which way, says Buck, and John spouts a lot o' dope joint lingo and takes us up a side alley where there's a whole bunch of old chinos waiting for us. And they began a cow towelin and going on like we was the whole cheese. Turned out that John had jollied em that the Mexican soldier man's was big medicine and would make Judge Ming quit the midnight hiking and cut out scaring them blue. That just suit Buck. He was all there when it come to play commander in chief. He swelled up and give him a bundle of old talk that John put in China for him and then finished up by showing them a button, a old United States Army brass button. He'd cut off his blue blouse and told him he was going to bury it in Ming's grave so as to keep him bedded down. And them simple idiots was pleased to death, and the whole outfit escorted us over to the graveyard, but they shed at the gate. Lord, I hated to see em go, even if they was heathens, and let John take us in and show us where to wait. He put us in behind a pile of old little rocks in about the middle o oh, the place near where Judge Ming hung out, and then retired on the main body at the double, leaving us two in outpost alone here together. I had never been to a China burying ground before, and night time wasn't extra pleasant for a forced introduce. There was a new moon that night, a little shaving of a thing that hardly gave no light, and from where we was there was a twisty pine tree branch that struck out right across it like a picture card. Two for five, the graveyard was all dark and quiet, with little piles of rocks and stone tablets to mark the graves and a four or five foot wall running all round it. And somehow, without nothing stun at all, the whole blame place seemed chock full o' moving shadows. There wasn't a sound neither, not the last little thing, just them shadows, and the harder you used to look at them, the more they seemed to move. It was cold, too, like I told you, bitten cold. And me and Buck squatted there tight together in moist freeze. We waited and we waited and we waited and we got skirter and skirter and skirter and gee, how we shivered. Every minute we thought we'd see Judge Ming, but a long time went by and he didn't come and he didn't come. There we sit strung up tight and ready to snap like a banjo string, but nothing to see but the shaking shatters and nothing to hear. Nothing but just dead, dead silence. All of a sudden, Buck, he can hear a pin drop a mile away. Nearly nips a piece out in my arm as he grips me. Listen, says he. I listened and listened, but I didn't hear nothing. And I told him so. Yes, you do, you bloke, you, he whispers. Listen, strain your ears. Then way off I did begin to hear something. It was a long, funny, wailing cry, so like the way cats holler at each other at night. Oh, 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 like that. And it come 
nearer and nearer. Then all of a sudden something popped up on the graveyard wall about a hundred yards away. Something all blue-gray against the hook of the moon and began walking up and down and hollering. I knew it was saying words, but I was so far up to the bad I didn't know nothing and couldn't make it out. I never thought a fella's heart could bang so hard against his ribs without busting out. And me, hair riz so high, me camping hat was three inches off, and me had a hope to the Lord I'll never be so frightened again in all my living days. I sat there in a trance from fear and fright, sir, the spot I don't know nothing Oh, what Buck was doing as my lamps was glued to the spook. It jumped down from the wall calling and whistling and began running round the little stone heaps. I seen it was coming our way, but I couldn't move. My lamps was glued to the spook. It jumped down from the wall, calling and whistling, and began running round the little stone heaps. I seen it was coming our way, but I couldn't move or make a sound. I just sit all of a sudden. Buck, he jumps up, makes a dash, and a leap at the spook, and there's a terrible yelling, and they both comes down crash at the foot of a rock pile rolling on the little pebbles. But Buck is on top, and the spook underneath, and letting off the most awful skeeches. Gosh, they just ripping the air. Them spooks yells did, and they just turned my spell loose, and I hauled for all I was worth. Then Buck, he commenced to yawping, too. But me and the spook, we was both raising so much noise, I didn't savvy what he said for some time. Then I found he was cussing me out. Come here, you forsaken. He howls. Quit yelling, I say. Quit yelling. Don't you see who this is? Come here and help me. You think I'm going to protect that ming spook? I shrieks. You miserable loony, he yells back. Can't you see it ain't no ming? It's ranch. Well, so it was. It was ranch, scared stiff and hollering for dear life at me and jumped on and waked up in the middle of a graveyard that a way poor old fellow had had dagged on his mind and went sleepwalking and hunting wrapped in his blanket. And says Buck ter me, if yous hadn't been in such a dope dream with Skeer, you'd a sensed what he was yelling. He was calling, oh, oh, here, Daggett, here, boy. And then he'd whistle and call again. Here, Daggett, here, Daggett. That's how I knew it was ranch. And besides, he told me, Yonked, that he sleepwalked when he got worried. But you, you white livered, and then he cussed me out some more. Smarty, I says, if you knew so blame well it was ranch, why did you give him the flying tackle like you done and get him all woked up like this? Well, says Buck, sort of sheepy, I was some worked up myself. And time he come along, I gave him the spook stackle without thinking. I was too scared to think. Hush, Ranch. Hush, old boy. It's just me and Bill. No, nobody shan't hot ya. He comforted the poor old Ranch and fixed him up. And then when he felt better, told him about things. All oh, but how Daggett was it, um... I wrapped his blanket around him and took him back to her quarters while Buck went a looking for John and his gang. He found him about half a mile off in front of a Malt Street Joss house, all praying and bunning punk and huddled together, scared green from the yellings that they'd heard. Buck, he gave him a long chin-chin about laying the ghost and how Judge Ming wouldn't ever come back no more, and then he dragged him all back, they pulling at the halter, Shanks with years lied, laid back and eyes a rolling to him bury his United States button on Ming's rock pile. He dropped it in the solemn and said, "What the chinks took to be a prayer, but he was really the oath." He said, "Buck, having unked been a recruiting sergeant, knew it by heart all the way from I do solemnly swear to so help me God." But says I. Ought to seen them grateful Chinos then. They'd a give him the whole Chino empire if they could. They got down and squirmed and kissed his hands and his feet and his sleeve. They wanted to escort him back to her camp. But he bucked at that and said no, as he was out without pass and not itching for his arrival to be noticed none. 
After that, we took Tin's watch and ranch at night and got him another much or love, and he didn't want her any more. So Judge Ming seemed satisfied with his United States button and kept quiet. But them chinks was the gratefulest gang you ever seen. They brought us presents, things to eat, fruit, poultry, eggs, and all sorts of chow. Some of it mighty funny looking, but it tasted all right. We lived high, we three. The other fellas was wild to know how we woked it. And I tell yer, I ain't never been scared old ghost since. That is not to speak of much. Bill paused drew a long breath, and looked at the clock. Gee, said he, most nine o'clock. I got to go over to K Troop to see Sergeant Keefe a minute. I promised him, adios, fellers. Thanks for the smoking. Keep the change, hombre. Thanks for your tail, shouted Whitney after him as he disappeared down the hall. Well, said Stone, and looked at Hanson. Well, responded Hanson, the big Swede shook with laughter. Is he not the finest lie? Yes, I was in the 14th myself. That was my company, Che. He was not even the army in then, in 1900. Yes, said Stone, I knew, but I was going to spoil his blooming yarn. I happened to see his enlistment card only this morning, and the only thing he was ever in before was a 23rd Infantry after they came back from the islands. He's never even been out of the States. But where did he get it from? asked Whitney. His imagination is equal to most anything but getting so many facts straight. Of course, I noticed things here and there, but the most of it was okay. I tell you, said Hanson, grinning. He got it from an old 14th man, Dan Powers, a practice camp last July. He and I was often talking of China. He was in my old company and was then telling me how he and the other fellers all that extra chow got. I think, Bill, he has got, got a good memory. But the nerve of him, cried Whitehall, trying to pass that off on us with Hanson sitting right there. It is one thing he may have forgot, smiled Hanson. Well, who cares anyway, said Stone. It was a blame good story, and now I'll clear out all of you. I want to hit the bunk. Revel does seem to come so early these cold mornings. Gee, I wish I knew of some kind of button that would keep me lying down when Shorty wants me to get up and call the roll. Ghost that got the button. End of chapter 18. Recording by John Smith.